Okay. Um, hello and welcome to the Sprint 46 review. We just keep coming and coming and coming. So cool. Um, this, was, <laughs> yeah. this was a regular uh, three-week sprint. No holiday. Oh, or did we have a holiday? Yeah, we had Labor Day. Yes, we did. One, one day shortened. Labor Day. Um, at least in the U.S. we had one day shorter here. Um, so it's, it's four, I guess, what is it, 14 days or 14 yeah. business days or yeah. 20 other days? Um, so anyway, uh, next slide, please. So we have a pretty big agenda here. So I'll, I'll talk about the statistics. Carol will give us an update on the community. Uh, Jillian will give us an update on the service broker. Uh, Greg Bloomquist on the providers. Uh, Dan on the UI. Greg T on the platform. Alberto on the REST API. Greg M on Automate. Uh, Rich, I don't think he will be speaking on Smart State today. Um, Dennis will tell us about performance. And uh, Dave Johnson on QE. Next slide, please. All right, so this was another solid sprint. 353 pull requests merged. Um, 120 of them were bugs, and uh, close to 100 were enhancements, and the rest kind of nicely uh, sprinkled out. Um, so it was a, kind of a good slice there. Next slide. Um, so as you can see there, uh, 171 uh, PRs in the UI, um, 100 in the providers, uh, 44 in the core and, and sprinklings everywhere else. Um, Automate has 24 and the API has 21. Um, as, the, as for the providers, we kind of started narrowing it down by the vendors. Um, so as you can see there, Microsoft has, I guess, 10 or 12 and VMware has 10. Um, and what else? Uh, Hawkular has 18. Um, containers has 13. Those colors are terrible. Um, we have the same color for two different things. Or three different things. Um, yeah. So let's note to self. Let's let's try to fix the colors for next time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've updated this chart here that we usually do with uh, putting on the bottom there not only the sprint numbers but um, releases of uh, upstream. So um, as you can see there, there's Darga Beta, Darga RC, GA, Darga 2, and Darga 3. Um, soon as we get OIWA underway, we'll have those labels as well, as well so they will kind of um, interlock. Uh, and I'm hoping we can start seeing even more trends that way. Um, next slide, please. So even though it was 353 in the main repo, 541 PRs in total, um, 91 of them in the uh, by the QE team in the integration tests, um, and then Docs also had uh, 15 pull requests in the uh, upstream documentation. Um, you can see the self-service there, the uh, Amazon provider, the uh, I think it's new for this uh, <clears throat> sprint, the, the API client, or maybe we'll start at the sprint before, but that's kind of moving along. Um, that's the actual client to wrap uh, a Ruby client to enable calling the REST API. Um, and, and everything else there on the list. So really um, solid performance there all around. Um, next slide, please. All right, over to Carol. <laughs> Thanks, Oleg. This is Carol uh, with the community update. So um, I think most of you have probably seen the uh, recently very active blog posts uh, with the last week in Manage IQ series. So we have eight posts so far. You can see from the blog link. Uh, Tim Wade kicked things off eight weeks ago uh, with the first post, and since then we've had. Um, I'll try to. Uh, list everyone so they get um, some recognition. Drew Baumhoff, Chris Arcane, uh, David Halas, G Julian Chiu, Jillian Tullo, Happy Martin Hradil, and uh, last but not least, uh, Zita Namikova. If I mispronounce anybody's name, feel free to raise an issue, submit a PR with your correct pronunciation. <laughs> I'll fix that next time. 
anyway, so um, and also a big kudos for to to John Prowse for organizing this thing, getting you know volunteers to write the blog posts and making sure uh, they are merged in time uh, every week. So it's a, a really good uh, team effort. Um, thanks everyone. Um, and uh, you know, my my part is easy. I just post them on the social channels. You can find them on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, Google Plus and LinkedIn, and for those channels with hashtags, you can easily get to them by searching for uh, LWIMIQ, Last Week in Manage IQ tag. Um, actually, uh, we, we would like to see, uh, like, um, for the blog on the website to have like categories. Um, there's no easy way right now to kind of have categories for like these uh, series as well as for maybe for releases and sprints and so on. So that kind of relates to the next um, point uh, with the uh, redesign of the website. We will improve stuff like that, um, have categories in blog. And um, again, this is like a major team effort from uh, Serena Doyle's uh, UX design team, you know, uh, doing a refreshing new look to um, people providing contents from documentations to guides, images, all kinds of uh, uh, up, up, updated, improved content, as well as, uh, as, of course, the IT guys who are making sure the systems are in place to have the site up and running and to keep it up and running. Uh, special shout out to Eric Hayes, who's the main person putting everything together um, from, you know, uh, the layout, I mean, the, the style sheets for the designs and the uh, menus for the documentation, content, everything. It's a lot of work, but um, we've also made already tons of progress. And currently the um, kind of the, the workspace is like a construction zone. So, you know, uh, even though uh, there's a lot of progress made, but it's uh, we don't want anybody getting hurt. So what we did was we took a couple of pictures, uh, screenshots of the construction zone to share in this uh, sprint review. So um, next next slide, please. So this is, um, oh, I should have done a drum roll or something. <laughs> this is how the new web page uh, will look like from the main page. Uh, the kind of main uh, goal of the redesign was to kind of get uh, new newcomers to manage IQ to have a quick way, easy way to start uh, using it, learning it. So that's why we have like the first thing you see is like a quick start, uh, you know, take a, take a short period of time to try it. Uh, with with uh, easy uh, uh, startups like Vagrant and Docker Images. But of course, uh, there's a lot more behind that as well. There's um, uh, the, the usual, the downloads for the different appliances and full documentation and so on. So um, this is just the preview for now. Uh, there's more coming. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. And this is an example of uh, part of, I think this is from the uh, developer guides. Uh, with the documentation, there's also like um, for the user reference docs and um, uh, quick start guides for the, uh, the, the what, what you saw on the front page. So um, it, it'll, it'll be all nicely organized with, you know, the, the site menus that you see here and, and uh, uh, basically more, more detailed and uh, nicely accessible. I think currently the website have like, uh, you know, mo many of the guides in PDF. So now we have them uh, in HTML and um, so it's e easily, um, uh, you can access them very easily from the website. So I think um, that's all I have. So next slide, thank you. Over to Jillian. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, so you'll notice here on the service, um, service UI page that the title is missing a self, and that's because um, we are actually renaming it to service UI due to expanding use cases. Um, also in the service UI, we're moving tests to a separate area. Currently, they're intermixed with the code, so we'll be updating that. And here on the bottom, you'll see a mock-up of the arbitration rules UI that the UX team is for, um, working on adding that into the service UI. Next slide. 
I'm going to pass it off to Serena now, who's going to do a demo of the service designer. Okay, great. What's the best way for me to do this? Should I send you a link to a YouTube video or can I share my screen? Share your screen. Share my screen. Perfect. Yep. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, okay. There we go. Here we go. You, you can't see my screen now, right? Nope. Oh, no. There you go. It's coming. Okay, great. Thank you. So right now, uh, you can see the self-service UI, right? Yep. Can you guys see it now? Okay, great. So I'm going to show them clicking in the designer area into the blueprints area. And when I do that, I can see a list of existing blueprints. If I create a new blueprint, I'm able to go to the add item toolbox, pull down a service bundle that's already existing and show how I can actually tag um, the item on the canvas itself. I can delete tags. I can also add new tags. Um, and when I save this, I'll show that show this as well. When I save this blueprint, I'll be able to bring it back up and, and show that those tags have been saved. Additionally, I can add tags directly to the blueprint itself. And it's in the same kind of mechanism where we're using, you select the category and value and add that onto the blueprint and save it. Um, I'm gonna rename the blueprint to new demo blueprint. Save it, go back to the list view to show that I'm actually exiting out. And then I'll bring it back up <clears throat> and show again that those tags have been saved. You can see there the environment's development. And below on that single item, you can see that the owner is the Windows 2008 test team. In addition to that, we have started doing the rules implementation, arbitration rules implementation. Um, so I can create a brand new one. It actually, this is an ordered list and it allows you to select items from a dropdown. Currently, um, we can do the if name equals whatever, uh, but we currently are not, we don't have the ability to read in the existing profiles at this point, but we have the ability to create items drag items to a different order, as well as um, we also have the ability to have some arrows when you hover over, you can actually change individual items that way as well as if you would rather not drag. Um, so again, this is the initial implementation. We're probably going to review it a little bit and a couple of little bugs as far as doing the dragging, um, but that's what we have to date. And thanks to both Dave Taylor and Jeff Phillips for the implementation on that stuff. I'll stop sharing. Any questions on that? Thanks, Arena. Thanks, guys. Over to uh, Greg B. Uh, oh, oh, I think we have one more slide here. Yeah, Jillian. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. So, yeah, no problem. Um, so the Blueprint API is about 90% complete. Um, have a couple more tweaks coming in probably this week or next. Um, Work is continuing on the arbitration engine, and we will also be moving the arbitration profile section to the service UI. Um, and that's about it. Okay. Next slide. There you go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, the sad news is I have nothing fun and interactive to fight this time. Um, no dancing, no nothing? No dancing. <laughs> Better on a Monday. Hey, Greg, Greg, you're a little hard to hear. I'm a little hard to hear, too. Um, is that better? Yes. Awesome. Um, but I do have tons of things to cover this sprint. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, Hocular. Whoa. Where'd we go? You didn't say next. Though. I didn't say next. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you messed me all up. I got to start over. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Hocular, uh, containers, uh, Google Compute, Azure, OpenStack, 
um, RevM changes, VMware and vCloud, and um, finally some core providers work. So now, next slide. All right, so on the Hocular side, um, they upgraded the Hocular Ruby client to 2.7.0. Um, got inventory and topology for JMS servers and uh, reports for transactions. Um, this is really cool because it like, shows like which transactions were committed, aborted, and timed out. Um, support for micro lifecycle for deployments. So this helps support both standalone and server group operations. Um, they changed all the routes to RESTful routes and um, several bug fixes. And if you remember from last week, everybody could say, and finally, this provider <laughs> had a lot of bug fixes. Uh, next slide. So on the container side, we've got some new reports. Um, pods for images per project and uh, pods per node. <coughs> and there was supposed to be another point there. Um, which was some metric rollups for disconnected, disconnected container groups. Um, so without this, we'd only know the metrics for container groups that were active when the metrics were collected. Uh, but now, um, or since that happens every hour, it's possible for a, a container group to be created and destroyed before we even see the metrics. Uh, and now we can actually collect the metrics for those things that kind of were, you know, ephemeral in that time. Uh, next slide. Also for containers, they added a deployment wizard. Um, this was done by Daniel. And there's tons of screenshots on the PR. I just grabbed a couple of them. Um, this probably deserves a proper demo because uh, it looks, I mean, the, the screenshots in the PR look really cool. Um, so. I would be interested to see a cool video demo of this <laughs> to actually see it in action. Um, next slide. From Google, we got uh, provisioning of preemptible VMs. And so last sprint, we saw inventory collection of preemptible VMs, and now we can actually provision them. So that's pretty cool, too. Next slide. On the Azure side, we got some uh, new event handlers for creating resource groups, um, VM captures, and also uh, Dan added a provider-specific logger. And this is kind of a little bit of a, <laughs> not Dan Clarizio. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of administrivia, but it's one of those things that makes debugging a whole lot easier um, when we're trying to track down what's going on in a provider. So thanks, Dan, for knocking that out really quick. Next slide. On the OpenStack side, we got uh, inventory for cloud volume backups, and we're showing the topology for under cloud. Next slide. Also for OpenStack, we're associating and disassociating floating IPs from the uh, VM menu, so you can go directly to the VM and associate and disassociate floating IPs. This is pretty cool because before you had to, you could only associate floating IPs during provisioning, I believe, and now you can control that outside of that uh, workflow. Next slide. From the RevM team, we got uh, the correct ho uh, host, OS, version, and type. Um, so before, I mean, inventory, it was always available there. We were just never collecting it. And now uh, the Rev team added that in, and now we can actually show the right uh, version and type for the host OS. Next slide. Um, they also added disk management in VM reconfigure. And you can see in the screenshot there, you can, uh, uh, I think, delete, delete disks, add new disks. Um, really cool feature to kind of round that out. Next slide. Uh, from VMware, um, I think this is one of the one of the last features for uh, storage profile support um, coming from uh, Adam worked on this. Um, yeah, so I think Adam actually prepared a video and sent it to me, and I didn't see it in my inbox, so I'm going to show that next sprint. But um, I think this pretty much finishes off all the storage profile um, all the storage storage profile feature for VMware. Uh, next slide. From the guys at XLab working on vCloud, we got orchestration stack status, um, so we can see what the what the status of the orchestration stack is. Um, 
they also added all of the network manager and inventory pieces, which was, um, I know it's just four words up there. It's really huge. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that was added. Um, and now we're getting all of the, um, all of the invent, all the cloud network inventory objects for vCloud. Next slide. On the networking front, um, our friends over at Google, uh, they added a PR to allow port ranges for load balancers. Um, this is something that Joe was just kind of looking at our um, our support for load balancers and realized that Google had a little bit different support for um, the how how they specify ports, and said, "I'm just going to go change it." And he did. It was awesome. Um, so thanks, Joe. Next slide. We also got load balancers in the UI. So I have been saying that we didn't have a UI for load balancers um, because I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, Ladislav uh, kind of snuck this in, and um, meaning that I didn't, I just never saw the PR. He did it. Some some guy on the UI team saw it, reviewed it, merged it. Um, so this is really cool. Uh, classic logic. All right, next slide. Elsewhere. All right, finally, on the pluggable providers front, um, Marcel worked on this cool thing where he's been working on the supports feature mix-in. And we had this idea that if you, since we have all this stuff kind of throughout the code where uh, we're docu basically documenting in the code what features are supported by which providers, we could just make that queryable and, doc and like build a document to say what which providers support which features. Um, I'm sure, you know, our breadth and depth isn't completely filled out yet, but this is a really cool thing. I'm really excited about it. Uh, that's it for providers. Over to next. Dan. Me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on the UI side, um, busy trying to get the head towards the end of the e-release here. Um, trying to get things uh, tied up. And uh, you can see there the the PR counts, I um, mean, you know, just a, a bunch again. Uh, a lot of bug fixes. I mean, all the stuff that's been going in, all of the uh, tech debt and refactoring, which you can see a few of those now, but um, have obviously caused a few, okay, a few bugs. Okay. So so a lot of those are that. Um, and that, you can tell that also because uh, the number backported to Darga is smaller. So um, most of those bugs are on the, on the master. So. Uh, in the tech debt refactoring area, um, I think Greg mentioned this, but the middleware provider was changed to use uh, RESTful routes. Uh, we had some more toolbars refactored. That's an ongoing uh, project, and uh, we just keep uh, you know banging away at them. Um, topology, <coughs> up, uh, what we're doing, we're seeing is you know topology is being used more and more. Um, I think um, post the e-release, we're going to try to um, kind of standardize how we use topology a little bit better, but to get there and to, to help not create more technical debt. Um, Martin P took a stab at uh, deduplicating the code a little bit, of, you know, a little bit of refactoring in there. So it's a little easier to to add those in. Um, also got one more tree converted, <clears throat> so we're uh, that's another project that I think we're down to around ten or a dozen trees left left to finish uh, using the tree builder and shared trees. Next slide. Did get some enhancements in. Um, we got uh, a subscription field added to the Azure Discovery screen. Um, we're going to show some of these. Um, we got the first cut of the notifications drawer and the, the toasting, toast notifications list stuff in. Um, uh, this is another small one that looks like a one-liner, but uh, Dynatree replaced with Bootstrap is <laughs> a huge project. Um, and uh, there's still a few little, you know, little uh, glitches in it, but uh, overall it's working great. Um, and, you know, that's the idea is that you don't notice the difference. But uh, there's a few uh, sorting issues and things and checkbox issues. But uh, those fixes are coming. Uh, the nice part about this is it's all the Patternfly bootstrap, Patternfly supported bootstrap trees. And so uh, actually some of the glitches are actually in fixed already, but we're waiting for a release from Patternfly. Uh, also added UI support for the vSphere distributed switches. Got that right, I think. Took a while to figure out what the V was for, actually for. Um, some support for child and parent relationships and orchestration stacks. And then middleware uh, added some, some uh, new object entities to the topology graph. So next slide. Ah, the subscription field, which I have no idea what it is, but Dan Berger <laughs> offered to talk. Dan, are you there? I'm here. 
All right. So originally on the screen, that subscription uh, text box at the bottom uh, wasn't there. And what would happen is in our attempts to be helpful, the gem would go and just grab the first enabled subscription automatically. The problem is some customers have a lot of subscriptions and what would happen is you'd get a mismatch between the tenant and the subscription and the users would get a strange error in the log. So now <clears throat> uh, that field is mandatory. We did discuss uh, the possibility of having, if no subscription ID was provided, just have it grab all providers for all subscriptions. Uh, the problem with that idea is that because some customers have so many subscriptions, that could be a lot of providers, which would trigger a lot of simultaneous refreshes. So that might be something we allow as an option in the future. But for now, it's going to be, uh, when you do discovery, it's going to be just for one subscription ID. Great. Thanks, Sam. All right. Next. All right, so this is a little preview. Obviously, there's no messages in it yet. So we have the uh, UI in for the notifications. And um, if any of you have been in development mode, you've actually seen things popping up with JavaScript errors. So we're actually using it in development mode. Um, but you'll start seeing things appear here in the future. See the little bell up there. Let's see, you know if, if you have any notifications. And some things will pop in front of your face. Some things will show up in the drawer. You can clear them and you know look through them. And it's going to be pretty cool. All right, next. There you go. The trees look almost the same. Obviously, there's just a little bit difference in the, some of the icons for the openers and things. Um, but that's the idea, right, is that the trees work and operate the same. You can't tell the difference, but we're using better technologies underneath. Um, Dynatree was, has actually been upgraded to some other open source project, and we just didn't want to follow that anymore, and we wanted to stay pattern fly-ish. So that's that. Next. Uh, this is the uh, vSphere distributed switches. So you tra travel down into infrastructure, there's a networking area, and you'll see all the switches in there. Uh, next slide, you can drill in and get a summary on them. There's not too much in there, but uh, hopefully this will expand maybe later. Um, you can also uh, jump into the hosts and things. I didn't go into that detail, but uh, you'll be able to look and see which hosts are attached to that, those switches. And next, not sure if I'm done. Three more. Oh, okay. So this is a child and parent relationships in the orchestration stacks. Here you can see there's a, I can actually see it better on this than I could on my, on my screen. Uh, you can see there's a, two, two children for this guy. And if the next slide, um, you'll see that there's a parent for that one. There you go. All right, next slide. Ah, yes, middleware. So they added uh, middleware messaging entities which tend to be a lot. I remember reading in the PR, what if there's a lot? Well, you can also turn them off. So I think, I think they're siding on the, on the side of show them and then you, know, you can easily turn them off, but it uh, gives them a definitely um, more vision into, the, into, the, um, into their topology graph. So awesome. That's it, I think. Next. Right. Over to Greg T. Oh, perfect. The mic. <laughs> okay, uh, so on the platform side, we had uh, 73 PRs merged, another big sprint. Um, we've had, we have enhancements in central admin, uh, database maintenance, chargeback, um, notification stuff that uh, Dan was just showing. It is the same stuff, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, tenancy, um, high availability for Postgres, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Alberto for the API. For the rest. <laughs> I can't use that anymore, we just say an API. Took it away. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so um, starting to pick up some momentum on central admin. So we, uh, one of the big pieces that um, it's kind of like behind the scenes is the server-to-server -server authentication, because we need to be able to um, invoke tasks on the uh, on a remote in a remote region from the global region, and we need to do that at the server level because it's most likely going to be running from asynchronously from the queue. So we have that piece in there. Um, and then the, the logic, we've been reworking the logic for invoking the tasks on the remote region, and that's kind of in a good place now. Nick's done a lot of work with that. Um, and we're leveraging the new API client. Uh, we'll start putting those pieces together, and Alberto will we'll talk about that a little bit, I think. No? Not yet. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it was mentioned, I think Jillian mentioned it. Next slide.
So we finally have the database maintenance. Basically, it's the same maintenance that uh, was separately distributed. Um, now we've added that to the appliance. GOV has done that. Um, Nick did some work on that as well. So you can see in the, um, in the appliance console, there's a new option there, configure database maintenance. And then um, so there's two things you can create, um, hourly re-index, and that's the, like the high churn tables, like metric, the metrics tables, uh, workers, uh, servers. Um, and then you can schedule a periodic full vacuum as well. And there's a bunch of tables in that list. Um, and if you look on the bottom there in the screenshot, that's just um, what it looks like after I went through the configuration of it. Next slide. So some work um, on chargeback going on. Um, this is kind of, right now it's all backend. There's no visibility to this, but um, we're adding the ability to support generating chargeback for a service so that you can see um, VMs grouped by service and then the total cost for, this, for that service. And that's gonna be used in the self-service UI for showing how much a service costs at some point. Hopefully, hopefully in the unit. Okay, um, so this, there's a couple more pieces to do for this so that um, we can get it in for the SSUI in a, in, in a way that they can use it. All right, next slide. So this is the notifi notification backend that Dan was talking about. So um, Jimon has been working on, on uh, the modeling for this. So um, the, the full model is done. Um, He's got the um, generation of authentication tokens, which is a bit different than what we have for API because it's for the pockets. Um, and then he wrote the API that the front end um, can call to, to get the notifications and display them. So that, that's making a lot of progress. Next slide. Okay, so um, in tenancy, we, uh, Libor has been working on the um, feature to map cloud tenants, external cloud tenants, to our managed IQ tenants. So um, I might have mentioned a little of this last sprint, but he's, he, there's a post refresh hook for OpenStack right now um, that at the refresh we can we can do the synchronization. Um, there's a new pro, a new tenant that would get created that represents like a base tenant for the provider, and then we would hang all the um, all the tenants with the, in their tree with the hierarchy underneath that base tenant. Um, and right now we're supporting create, update, and delete. And Libor actually made a demo for this, so I'm going to share it. And hopefully it uh, comes, comes across well enough. Is the overview what we did in cloud tenant mapping so far. Uh, cloud tenants or so called projects are basically tenants in OpenStack. Cloud tenant mapping is process of creating and synchronization tenants to manage IQ from these cloud tenants. For a possibility to do this, we added a branch ID to cloud tenants because OpenStack with Keystone V3 supports hierarchical tenants. Then we added the post refresh hook, which runs mapping. And first of all, base tenant is created. This tenant is matching cloud OpenStack provider. And under this tenant is three created from cloud tenants. During mapping, tenants are synchronized and updated, and related VMs are assigned to these tenants. Last three mentioned things uh, belongs to this print. On the right side uh, here is the tree created in Manage IQ. On top of tree, we have root tenant, my company, and under this tenant, there are created base tenants related to providers. And under providers tenant, there is created tree from cloud tenants. So we have uh, OpenStack provider, with some cloud tenants. And these cloud tenants uh, have already hierarchical structure, but it is not visible on this screen. I'm going to three of tenants, what we have in Manage IQ. 
at this moment we have there only root tenant called my company. Now, now I'm going to refresh OpenStack provider and after refresh page we can see that uh, tenant tree have been created. Uh, VMs are assigned to related tenants. Name of a base tenant uh, contains prefix OpenStack Cloud Provider and name of provider. Each tenant have, has relation to cloud tenant or provider. Uh, last thing what I'm going to show you is what's happen when I'll delete uh, tenant in OpenStack. So we are going to delete uh, tenant uh, which is leave and uh, name is uh, parent free. Uh, so there is deleting. Now we are going to refresh and. In this case, uh, cloud tenant is deleted, but not matching tenant. Such tenant is moved out to the first level under base provider. Uh, VMs still belong to this tenant, but uh, we can find VMs uh, in the archive state. This is all for, for this demo. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Libor. Nice job. <laughs>
This is also uh, fairly standard for setting up uh, an external database. So we're creating a region. We're going to enter the region number, the authentication information. So this will initially set up with the first database, and then we'll be able to see that in the uh, database YAML, and then we'll see that switch once we get over to the failover. Region, three movie magic. All right. So at this point, we've got the manage IQ services running. Um, I think we'll sit and wait for these to come up properly. Make sure all the seeding is finished up. Uh, a little more slight movie magic. And we've got our workers. Uh, so we're going to run back over to the first database appliance. There's one more step we need to set up to configure uh, Rep Manager properly. Uh, so we have to initialize what, what's called a node in the Rep Manager cluster. Uh, pretty quick, we just need to pick a node ID, uh, set up the, the access information. Um, so uh, username, password, those are the, the standard database username, password. Then we need to enter the IP address of the local machine, which seems a little strange, but this is actually for um, access from all of the other servers. So this should be the, the host name that all of the other servers, including the application, would use to access this server. We're going to jump over to the failover database. There's a separate option here, uh, configure database replication, uh, and configure a standby. Pick a separate node ID, set up all the same cluster information. This will do the initial sync, uh, the PG base backup from the first database, and then also uh, start up the database server locally in standby mode. Uh, so that will start the rep manager daemon that will monitor the first database for failover and then promote this one if it goes down. All right, so that's all set up. You can see that it's running as a standby. Console. All right, and then we have to set up the failover monitor daemon on the application servers to make sure that it can check when the database is failed over and modify the configuration accordingly. And that's all set up. So we're going to take a look at database YAML. Um, for comparison purposes, you'll see that this is all set up with database one uh, here. Uh, and then this is a new configuration that is used by the failover monitor uh, to see the cluster information. So that's what we currently have. We have a master and a standby. And then I think we're going to run right into the failover demo. Uh, oh, no, we're going to take a look at the database first. Uh, so this is the table that we actually pull that information from. This is a rep manager table specifically geared towards uh, using that information. So we essentially just pull the contents of the connection information and uh, save those in a flat file on the server. And then just to make sure replication is working properly, take a look at the MIQ servers table, and that all looks great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our server's up and running. Uh, we're going to go right into the failover demo. So we're going to just go ahead and kill Postgres on our primary server. Don't do this at home. <laughs> do it <that> work? <laughs> All right, so now many things are panicking. Um, so we can take a look at the Postgres service on the standby. We'll look at that later. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've already noticed that the primary server is down, and we're going to start to execute failover. So here, if I could pause properly. There we go. We can see um, this indicates that we're still in recovery mode, so Rep Manager hasn't actually executed the failover to the standby server yet. I guess the EVM server knew right away because he 
connection. Which is right. Out. So, and then there are also configuration parameters that we can tweak to, uh, okay, so the failovers happened. Um, oh, that was a bit quick, but. Uh, there are configuration parameters we can tweak to determine when the failover happens. All right, and then here, you can see we're failing over to database two, and we're starting the server back up. So we can see that there's already a connection to this server, uh, 213 there. And we can take a look at EVM server come back up with the new database configuration. So manage IQ starting up. And shortly we'll have our workers. Yep, so they've all come up successfully. And there are all of our connections on the standby server. And then we can take a look at the new configuration that will show that we set up. Uh, we're now connected to database two. And, uh, and then the new failover config uh, shows that there are two master servers, but one's no longer active. Um, so we pulled the new information from the failover server. And that's that. Awesome. So there are a couple of questions on the chat, Nick. I'm sure there are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read them. Are there? Do we want to jump into that after, or? No, do it now. Okay. Are there any notifications, alerts, reports for when a DB database has failed over, and which DB server is running the new DB? Um, not on the app side, no. Probably good RFE. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, and the other one is, I says, I assume this is a strictly a clone database, the standby, and is not used to reduce load on the master. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, it's not a load balancer. It is solely in the standby is in read-only mode, um, so can't be used to, to service cool. standard write queries. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Yep. Full demo, no mouse clicks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next slide. I think that's it for platform, and yep, we'll turn it over to Alberto. Alrighty. All right. So on the API side, uh, Tim has been quite busy refactoring our source code base, uh, showing here some of the uh, things we've done. Uh, the namespace went back to the API. It was managed at the API, um, and the, the routing has been simplified uh, API, and then. As you can see, we've now also converted the collections to individual controllers, as shown below with the um, equ equipment rats above. And we just moved the entry point to its own API uh, controller under that namespace. So a lot of work there. Thanks, Tim. Off to the next slide, please. OK, uh, so this is all part of the work uh, Shimon did for the uh, notifications. So the first thing was uh, well, he did some refactoring on the, the token manager itself, uh, breaking out the token manager and the token store. Uh, but the main thing here is we also added uh, we added a new requester type for the WebSocket because um, we supported before API and UI, but now we also support WS. So, um, so these are tokens strictly for uh, the WebSocket work, uh, and they're not uh, they cannot be used for API authentication, so, but it, they have to use the API to get them in a the <coughs> So that was that enhancement. Off to the next slide, please. All right, so Shimon also did the notifications uh, enhancements. So we have a, uh, a new collection API notifications, uh, and for now we're supporting the queries. Um, so here you'll get the notification that applied to you as in the authenticated user. Um, and we also added the, uh, the new action mark as seen. So you can mark that the one you've read uh, either the individual uh, notification uh, by posting on the resource or if you have a list of them to target the collection with all the, well, with all the resources. Right, off to next slide, please. Alrighty, uh, so this was an enhancement uh, by Martin P. Um, 
to adding uh, adding support for the uh, cockpit uh, in the uh, SSUI. So similar to what we've done for um, uh, for the VMs, uh, this is a uh, introducing a new decorator. So it's called supports cockpits, and as you can see, how currently it's used in the SSUI. You know, you would be browsing services and requesting to expand the the VMs for that, and asking for a special decorator for that for the for the VM. So uh, quite involved, but uh, very flexible from a caller perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, Martin H. Um, added an enhancement to the entry point for the API entry point so that we can uh, uh, provide the information needed for the new uh, about uh, the about model. Um, so as you can see here, there's a server info a hash in the main entry point that gives the information that, that they need. Um, next slide, please. Alrighty, so this is an enhancement so we've made to support the bulk queries. Um, there was a re there's a request uh, for this, um, but it's it's actually beyond beyond what's uh, provided so far. But here we allow um, queries for multiple. So let's say you have uh, you know 100 or 200 uh, VMs you want to query by ID or HF, uh, you can do that. Um, this is uh, this will also be used uh, by the uh, API client for multiple finds. Uh, but again, this is step one, uh, another v another PR to follow where uh, we can also specify other attributes, you know, based on the resources. So GUIDs, or for example, for VMs and description for groups. But uh, uh, again, the the direction to do a post here because you know even if we supported IDs on the uh, on the get um, itself, there's there's a, of course a character limit. So, but this will provide us um, a lot longer. Uh, requests and more flexible on the signatures. So, so that's provided on the on the collections today. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and um, yeah, this is an enhancement to uh, the blueprint. So, Jillian, you want to describe a bit on that? Sure. So, um, we now support removal of service catalog and service dialogues from a blueprints bundle. Um, in order to do so, you need to explicitly um, specify a nil value for those. Um, without them, the bundle just assumes that you know, they, they're staying the same. So this update ensures that the nils get passed to the update bundle method so that they're properly removed. Cool, Friday. Thank you, Jillian. And I think that's it for the API. Cool. So. On Automate, uh, one of the enhancements we got in was supporting the overwrite flag for uh, rake import tasks. Prior to this, if the domain existed already, it would perform a merge, which works down to a class level. So um, instances, methods being deleted or updated, uh, you wouldn't see that. So really to perform a full refresh of that domain, um, you need to use the overwrite true flag falses. Build the default for that. Um, and then we added a helper method around retirement in Automate. Uh, this extends, reti extend, retires on. Um, so it allows you to specify the number of days you want to extend retirement for. And you can see the method signature in the second bullet point there. Um, you can also specify the date. So the current is the current date and time and just give it the day. So it's a common uh, extension that people do from custom buttons or other automate uh, methods to be able to push retirement out for specific uh, items that support retirement so that it's uh, implemented through the mixing level. So anything that supports that retirement will get this method. So right now it's services, uh, VMs. I put templates in there. Uh, templates is not correct, obviously. We're not retiring templates. Uh, and orchestration stacks, but it, it it's implemented at the base VM or template class. So that's that's how that got in there. Uh, cool. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so had a request to expose. I want to say it was volumes at this point, but uh, so to get there, exposed a number of levels within the automate model to get down to that. So uh, from VMs and hosts. You have hardware, we expose the partition relationship at that level. 
and then created two new service model classes to wrap partition and volumes and expose their available uh, relationships from there. So dis hardware volumes for partition and hardware and partitions for volumes. Next slide. Uh, so in the provision automate modeling, we support the, uh, the pre and post provision methods for all the different providers. We realized that Azure method points were missing there. So we had to update the class schema as well as provide the methods and then users that want to can just override the methods and implement their own logic. So that came in this sprint and next sprint, uh, Google was also missing Google Compute Engine. So that'll come in the following sprint for the same exact functionality. And one more slide. So this is Dan's favorite slide, or at least he's <laughs> told me so. Um, the reset in the automate domain, uh, ever since we implemented domains, the reset text was kind of confusing and, and or misleading. Um, so we updated that message to, to tell you what domains will be affected when you reset them. It's basically the domains that we ship on the appliance or that are sitting within the fixtures uh, directory. Those will get, when you hit reset, they get deleted and then reset from what's on disk. So wanted to make it clear what, uh, what domains, what items would be affected when you run that process. And then I don't have slides, but it, just wanted to mention the other areas that were worked on in this sprint was still more effort around the pluggable provider domains. Um, that's still moving forward. A lot of work around generic objects, mostly around being able to run methods uh, from those generic objects, defining them and, and calling into automate. Um, working on one last piece there, which is ensuring the proper user identity gets passed when we call those methods. Um, and then a number of back end PRs around blueprint work. So that stuff's all in progress. And that's it. Next slide. Over to Dennis. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so uh, this sprint, there were two, two focus areas, uh, the tree builder uh, performance and uh, virtual delegates. Um, tree builder uh, introduced some patterns across uh, about 10 screens, changes, um, focus a lot on the VM Explorer and Service Explorer. We'll see a little more of that in a minute. Uh, and virtual delegate changes, um, and there'll be some, we'll show you a little about the VM Explorer, uh, the work there. Uh, additionally, there were some there was effort expended to uh, set up a, uh, some test environment down in the Wallet Data Center, some shared uh, shared machines. So we can going forward, we can have a baseline and, and uh, start comparing what's happening. And uh, one of the men behind the curtain, Keenan, has graciously uh, volunteered to give us some details. Um, starting the next slide, please. Um, so uh, builders, as uh, Des mentioned, uh, builds the left-hand side, and so we found a common pattern across 10 builders uh, where, in essence, um, we are adding queries together. Um, so this is basically downloading all of our data uh, just to, to get a count. So by uh, splitting these apart, again, um, in the uh, VM Explorer, for example, it was about 10% faster and a third of the, ro uh, third of the rows brought back uh, from the database. So uh, simple patterns that were just uh, scouring the code. Again, we found in, in 10 different screens. And so I just showed you results for one. Uh, Mary, next. So uh, also on the tree builder uh, for the services explorer, we, uh, instead of going uh, level by level and pulling back data, um, the, the tree builder now supports hierarchy so we can get that in one fetch. Uh, so, so we, we move some of the filtering to the database um, and then also just bring back all of them together, uh, which ended up being 60% faster, 98% uh, fewer queries, and a third the rows coming back from the database. So, next. Now, uh, Nick wasn't happy with uh, only 60% faster, uh, so he worked on uh, image path enhancements uh, where we're actually looking up the icons for the service, um, which made it 50% faster. So uh, the end result was 81% uh, faster uh, service screens, uh, which on raw hardware, that's uh, 22 seconds down to four seconds. So uh, we kind of needed this screen to be a little faster. This is uh, about 
uh, 10,000 services. Uh, we are working on uh, ramping it up to you know closer to the 50,000 services to see how that works. But at least we got a good win of 81% faster. Um, next read. Uh, a little more on the darker side of things. Um, uh, virtual delegates teaches Active Record how to access fields from another model, um, but the key is it's doing it in the database. So I'm sure if uh, people are on the call, they hear me always talking about this virtual attribute, virtual um, virtual delegates. So uh, one example of something we hit was uh, EVM user owner ID. Uh, we we taught it. You know what? If you need this data, just go to another table. So that's what a virtual delegate's about. Uh, we got some enhancement in there that uh, we have a default value and also if we're delegating to a different name. So uh, what are the implications? Something like that seems pretty trivial. It looks like it's UI. Uh, but on the VM screen, if you're trying to sort by, say, the, the total snapshots uh, for 10,000 VMs, it ends up uh, taking you know, from 44 seconds down to nine seconds, uh, which yeah, this speaks for itself. It gets rid of about a third of the database rows brought back into memory, uh, which again, we have garbage collection, all that kind of stuff which comes up there. Uh, and it, it was just shy of 80% faster. Um, so at least uh, little changes like that, uh, I, I think are a little prettier, but also uh, they're making our code uh, faster. So uh, go on to the next screen. So building on that, um, it, when we are viewing the uh, VM Explorer for current user LDAP group, uh, we were uh, uh, we introduced the uh, the changes showed on the previous page, and this one this is flubbed a little bit to make it fit on the slide. But all in all, we taught the uh, the database how to determine the own owned by a current user. So that's virtual attributes. So we're using virtual attributes and virtual delegates together, uh, deleting code in the process. But uh, something like this uh, took a screen that was taking 50, uh, took 51 million objects, and now we're doing 130,000 objects. So all of our numbers actually got rid of a decimal place, um, and it's 99.5% uh, faster. So it took uh, almost two minutes, or a minute and a half, down to 0.5 seconds uh, for this change. So so again, that's uh, it's kind of virtual attributes of work. Uh, next screen. Cool. That's all for us. Thanks. Hey, how's it going? So you guys can hear me? Yes? No? Yep, no yes. Here. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, so Dave Johnson, Quality Engineering. Uh, development has been keeping us very, very busy. Um, you know, just at a high level, we're continuing to test the new features from the last sprint opening up issues where we find them. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, could go down and, and get into a little bit more detail, and, and that is something that we want to do kind of moving forward on, on some of these calls, but, but keeping it to a minimum few slides is, um, is uh, something that we need to kind of figure out how to, how to work uh, into this slide deck, so um, hopefully there will be more, um, a, a little bit more granularity into kind of where we're spending our, our effort. Um, we, uh, we're, we're opening up GitHub issues as we find them. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the newer features uh, are, are looking to be in good shape from what was delivered last sprint, um, where we do find issues, and, and if they are kind of more serious blocking issues, we're, we're starting to use the blocker flag. Um, we might want to revisit kind of some better labeling and, and uh, create uh, maybe high and urgent kind of severity labeling. Uh, moving forward, um, uh, on the QE team, we also did a, uh, a internal review of our test cases and test coverage, um, uh, and just trying to identify gaps in, in our test coverage. Uh, we really want to open this up to development and, and and really anybody else that's interested in helping out. Um, you know, contact me. Uh, we would uh, certainly be interested in hearing your two cents. Um, on top of that, you know, just continuing with a lot of bug verification, um, a, a lot of a lot of issues coming in for for both the Darga and the the e-release um, that are keeping us very busy. Uh, as we also continue to uh, improve on the test automation framework and, and just trying to fix some of the the, the 
the test automation to work with some of the changes that are going on in the, the different interfaces of the, the, the new release. Um, so next slide. Just gonna kind of share some, um, some uh, changes that we made to our framework. Uh, caution, you know, Python code is, is gonna be displayed on the screen here in a minute. Um, hopefully it's not for the faint of heart. Um, please, you know, look away if that's gonna cause your head to explode. Uh, Pete? Hi, you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so we spoke about uh, framework 3.0 um, at the at the uh, summit. So we've just given a little bit of update uh, on what we're doing there. We have now got our first uh, object registered with Sentaku uh, for the classic UI only. Uh, we still need work on converting the other objects. So for now, it's not currently in use, but it, it will be soon. Uh, for those of you who are hearing this for the first time, Sentaku is uh, our uh, project name for a system that will allow us to use basically the same method names uh, on some of our objects, and the the context uh, for that operation will be decided either by uh, the user if they want to force the context or via a, a preferential list. So what this means is we can have the same uh, method name like uh, provider.create, provider.delete, um, and those uh, methods have multiple implementations, either via rake or via command line, via uh, the classic UI, via REST. And we can either force uh, Sentaku to choose. We can say, I want you to do this operation via REST. Or we can just say, hey, just pick whichever one is fastest. Um, and it will use the preferential order um, to, to pick whichever one is, is the most preferential one. Uh, the second thing that we did was we have now merged in a new navigation library called NavMazing. Uh, it's ready to be used. Uh, two of our uh, engineers, Yevgen and Mike, are starting to work on converting some of our navigation destinations. Uh, the old library and the new library don't conflict, so we're going to have a, a slow cutover. It's a lot more object-based. Um, it's a lot more explicit, uh, which means it is a little bit more verbose. Um, but we had an issue with the old system. It was it was quite confusing for some people to use. There was a lot of context passing around. Um, as some of you know, we do version picking, so we have a single code base that tests each version of a uh, supported version of uh, Manage IQ. And we have included here uh, Am I Here support uh, in our navigation framework. Uh, what that enables us to do is uh, shortcut the navigation. So if we are already at a page, then we don't need to navigate uh, any further down the tree. So next slide, please. And this is just a, a little bit of a, a kind of idea of what the code changes. Uh, so previously, you would have a, uh, a provider object, that's what prov is, and we had this uh, force navigate function where you would put the destination that you wanted to go to, so in this case it's the, the cloud provider destination, and you would have to pass this context, uh, which was a dictionary containing the uh, provider object, uh, because there was a, a function in the back end that looked for that particular uh, object and pulled the name out from it, et cetera, et cetera. That was quite um, cumbersome to use. So the new system we think is a lot easier to use. Uh, now you, you just have the same provider object and we just have navigate to, we give it the object that we want to perform navigation on and we say, hey, I wanna to go to your details page. Uh, and so that will go to the details page. Uh, obviously this is heavily uh, UI focused. You wouldn't use NavMazing for, for any, you know, any other kind of endpoint. Um, but the, the onus is around us being able to use this same framework for any of the, um, you know, the, the graphical user interfaces that we have. So that's all the updates from me. Uh, next slide, please. Milani, you on? No, Milan. Okay, so uh, Milan has put together a uh, 
another piece of functionality that he's uh, uh, naming uh, Widgetastic, and, and basically this is uh, a way to um, model uh, UI components uh, into uh, you know a, a testing suite. Um, currently building up some basic pattern file library of items that are in Manage IQ. Um, he gave a demo to the pattern fly team, uh, and uh, they're pretty excited about it, and and and. Uh, potentially interested in using it um, so those kind of those talks are ongoing but this is you know yet another kind of improvement to the test automation framework to um, uh, you, you know just simplify and, and improve uh, the features and functionality that uh, the framework offers uh, currently it's in a Red Hat QE um, repo uh, we're, we're currently investigating if it makes sense to kind of move that underneath the, the manage IQ umbrella um, so, you know, some discussions are going to go on right now. It's just, you know, it's a more of a proof of concept that um, that our team is kind of putting together and, you know, we, you know, we'll figure out where the proper place to store it um, in the future. Um, next slide. Uh, and uh, I'm not even going to speak to this, uh, but this is basically just a, a way to um, uh, d decide how to interact with some of uh, the elements on uh, in the framework uh, that are displayed in the UI. Um, uh, we'll just say next slide. All right. Um, so that concludes our Sprint 47 uh, Sprint 46 demo. The next one is in three weeks. Sprint 47. Um, that one in three weeks, that's uh, the time that we will be uh, making a uh, OIWA release. So that's coming at that time. Um, not the GA thing, but uh, beta that we can start testing. Um, and that's it. So uh, are there any questions or comments? I think we've answered most of them here in the, most of the questions in chat already. All right. If there's nothing else, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Um, it's it's really kind of the project is growing. It's getting bigger. Lots of people involved, and uh, it's really cool to kind of see it all come together every time. Um, SQL schema freeze date. SQL schema freeze date for Oiwa is Monday. In five days or whatever that is, September 19th, I want to say. Yep. So get your stuff in. Um, everything after that for OIWA is going to be on a exception basis to update the SQL schema. Meaning you got to ping me and some other people to kind of get it accepted. Um, we'll also be making the OIWA branch next week so that people, so that we can start diverting uh, the master and the stabilizing the E, the e branch and uh, moving forward on master. That's it. So thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.